Hey there guys, Attic PC guy here, and uh, lately I've been doing a lot of videos on cooling, and uh, specifically I wanted to do a video on the basics of water cooling. Now I will be trying to cover the basics of water cooling uh, a bit on the surface level, without going into full detail about everything, about every single part, and uh, all of that. I will be trying to give a small overview of uh, advantages, disadvantages. Uh, risks, dangers, benefits, uh, as well as what you need and some things that you need to keep an eye out when uh, getting parts for your own water cooling loop and uh, again without going into details of every single brand and model and uh, sizes and all of that stuff but I'll try to give a good overview for people who just need a bit more information before they set out to find more detailed information for their case. Now, why should you water cool or why should you not water cool? It's a matter of preference and a matter of uh, if you are willing to have some maintenance involved on it or not. Uh, air coolers are installed in a matter of a few minutes. Uh, you just put it in, it's done, over with. You might have to clean the fans every once in a while, but that's a matter of minutes again. Uh, water cool coolers can be a bit more complicated in terms of maintenance. Uh, you might need to replace the fluid every couple of years, depending on the quality of the fluid. You might need to uh, clean up the pipes a bit uh, if your coolant of choice uh, provides problems. Uh, so yeah, there is some more maintenance involved, specifically with some sorts of tubing, as I will get uh, down to it uh, a bit later. And uh, you have to keep a sharper eye on looking for tr problems and trying to prevent them from getting any worse if they should arise. So on the maintenance side, water cooling is a bit more of a handful. It is also more difficult to set up. Uh, you might say that if you're an experienced water cooler, it's not that complicated and uh, it's probably true, but in any case, it's still more complicated than slapping a fan on a component and calling it a day. So, uh, there is also that thing. On the other hand, uh, if you are a PC enthusiast, the challenge alone and the, the increase in performance are enough to make you go for it. Water cooling um, is a step above normal air cooling uh, when it comes to uh, cooling potential. And it is also superior to uh, just buying an AIO off the shelf and then slapping it on a part. Uh, while AIOs are on the level of good water cooling or potentially a bit better, they still fall short of uh, a custom loop water cooling. But, um, well, I have actually not explained, but an AIO is basically a closed loop water cooling that just comes ready in a box. You install it and it's done. And you don't have to worry about it again unless problems arise, of course. So, it's kind of the intro steps for water cooling for people who are a bit on the fence if they want to build their own loop or not, but it is uh, effective and uh, simple. Another advantage of water cooling is the aesthetics of it. Uh, a normal CPU air cooler, for example, if you have a good one, it's going to be quite a blocky thing. Uh, as opposed to the water block that you use when water cooling, it's usually quite a lot smaller and more elegant and can even be a, a bit uh, aesthetically pleasing, uh, especially when compared to a big bulky fan with some hint sinks. Also, um, a water cooling setup is usually a lot quiet than uh, an air cooling setup, especially if you are running a an appropriate amount of fans and a big enough radiator so that the fans don't have to spin as hard, it will be a lot quieter. A big disadvantage, however, is the price. A water cooling uh, loop, especially a custom one, will be a lot more expensive to build and maintain than uh, air cooling, as well as time consuming. That said, if you are getting serious about being a PC enthusiast, or if you just want the best of the best performance that will allow you to overclock your software a bit harder and while keeping it running cooler at the same time, then water cooling is definitely the thing for you. Now, if you are thinking about it and embarking on this journey, then what exactly do you need? You're going to need an amount of parts and within each type of part, you will need a specific uh, model, make, size, whatever, that will have to match what you have in mind. Now, as a rough list of what you'll have to get, you'll definitely need water blocks. Those are the, I will go through each one by one, but you'll need water blocks, you'll need a reservoir or a pump. Well, you'll definitely need a pump. Some pumps are combined with reservoirs in one piece. Reservoirs are, in theory, 
optional, but they make it a lot easier for when you have to empty the your water cooling loop for maintenance or so replacing a part or just uh, cleaning and uh, replacing the coolant. So while option, optional, they are strongly advised. Then you will need fittings. Fittings uh, are essential mostly for hardline, but you also need a bit for softline. Speaking of hardline and softline, you will also need tubing. Now tubing can come in uh, different types of tubing, obviously, You but you can mostly group them in hardline tubing, so rigid tubing, or softline tubing, which is soft flexible tubing. Finally, after all those parts, you will need a few more thingies. Uh, that would be a radiator for the heat to actually leave your system, and some fans for that radiator so that the air that gets uh, warmed up by that radiator will also leave your system, obviously. Uh, otherwise, the heat is just going to sink in there. Obviously, you will also need fluid for your water cooling loop. Now, this fluid comes in many colors, shapes, and sizes, but uh, all of them have some things in common, which I will address uh, when I go for the part-by-part -part breakdown, which I will do now. Now, before going into detail on the parts themselves, we should talk about the materials first, briefly. Now, the parts like the water blocks, the radiator, uh, the fittings, they will also have metallic parts in them. And those metallic parts are actually uh, of some importance, because it is usually advised to keep uh, the, those metallic parts of all the same type of metal. So you have fittings made primarily out of uh, copper, aluminum, brass, um, and yeah, there might be others, but those are the most common ones. And um, it is important to, if you have, for example, copper water blocks, to also have copper fittings and uh, uh, copper based radiator. Same for brass, uh, same for aluminum. If you have aluminum in one part, you should have aluminum on all the other parts. And why is this? This is because of something called galvan uh, galvanic corrosion. Uh, and if you have different types of uh, metals in your water cooling loop, they will basically uh, corrode each other over time. And uh, you might it might introduce other points of failure, and uh, the basically the least the less points of failure you have on your system, the better, and the less it gets uh, corroded and um, damaged over time, also the better. Now for the parts themselves, I will start uh, by the core of your water cooling kit, which would be the water blocks. Th those are some of the most important parts in your blocks. Uh, in your loop, water cooling loop, I mean, they're the heart of your cooling, and that's what actually will cool your components. Now, they're basically made out of a cold plate that is in contact with the the heat spreader on the die of your either GPU or CPU, or RAM in some cases, but uh, anyway, CPU and GPU are the most common ones. Uh, they can be made of the metals that I uh, previously mentioned, and uh, they come in all sorts of uh, forms, shapes, and sizes. Uh, they are specific to each socket type or to each CPU, so you can't just grab a water block from a 3 year old CPU from let's say LG1150 socket and slap it on an 1151 socket. Some might be cross compatible if the socket is the same size, most are not. So if you are ordering a water block for your CPU for example, make sure that you are the one for the right socket and the right uh, CPU that you have. As you can see, they come, uh, I'll just grab a random example, they come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, and orientations, and all that. Some have LED lights, some have a little uh, transparent acrylic or something um, plate above so you can actually see the water flow. Uh, there are many varieties of them and you can just you know, pick whatever you prefer. Uh, granted that it is for your socket type. Now for the GPU in particular, there are a bit more choices. They are usually graphics card specific, so they are done for that model of graphics cards. And there are several types. There's the blocks that only cover the, the die, basically the core of your graphics card where the computations are made. There are other blocks that are a bit longer. Uh, oh, this is an example of one that only covers the die. There are other blocks that are a bit longer, as those you can see, that also cover the power delivery system and the RAM modules. And those are these little things that you see here. They also generate heat and they also benefit from being cooled. So those are usually more advised and more effective at cooling your graphics cards. Otherwise, it's the same story as with the CPU water blocks, a cold plate at the bottom, the water loop on top, and um, LED lights, fittings. 
you name it. Sometimes there's also a backplate on the other side, but that's more for aesthetic reasons and to give a bit more structural support to the graphics card itself. Now, the next topic would be the radiator. Radiator is uh, much like the radiator in your car or the, in your AIO cooler. The warm water will come into the radiator on one side, go out the other, and the heat will be transferred to the fins in the radiator here that you can see, and that the air will flow, flow through with the help of the fans that will be installed on the radiator. Now, what is there to keep in mind when choosing a radiator? First of all, the metals, like on the previous one that I mentioned. Uh, the size, you want a size that uh, is uh, adequate for what you are going to be cooling. Uh, some people advise uh, uh, 140 uh, or 120, one of the two, 120 I believe. Uh, at least 120 fan and 120 radiator size per component being cooled. So, But if you are overclocking, I would at least double that, so a 240 space for each radio, uh, component being cooled. Uh, that said, they come in a variety and multitude of sizes, shapes, forms and colors and materials. They come in increments of uh, fan size. So fans are 12 and 14 centimeter or 120, 140, whatever you prefer. So for 12 centimeter fans, radiators would, co would come in 120, 240, 360, 480 and so on. Uh, and same story for the 14 centimeter fans. Uh, you can mix and match as you prefer. Uh, obviously, bigger fans uh, move more air and, and tend to be si more silent, but space is usually a concern, and in most cases they are more uh, geared towards the 120 type of fans. So uh, keep that in mind and check with your case what your case supports. Something to keep in mind when picking a radiator, fin density or fin or fin spirit per inch FPI. That means how dense the fins actually are on the radiator. More fins means more heat transference, but also uh, more difficulty in the air going through and potentially a little bit more noise. So you have to kind of balance out uh, noise and eff efficiency versus uh, silence and uh, a little bit less cooling. Uh, it's a personal choice. They also come in uh, uh, varying degrees of thickness from uh, 3 centimeters to 6 centimeters and 8 centimeters each uh, uh, width, I mean, for the width of the radiator. More width means more cooling, also more difficulty in the air getting through again due to that resistance. If you have a very thick radiator, you might need fans on both sides. Otherwise, you can usually get away with fans on only one side if you have a, a radiator that is on the thinner side. Now, for reservoirs. Reservoirs are an interesting story in that they are usually optional. But while being optional, they end up being almost mandatory because they make it a lot, lot more easy to um, drain the system, to remove the fluid for maintenance. They make it a lot easier to drain that fluid out or to bleed out the air bubbles when you're first putting the fluid in, and also they make it a lot easier to put the fluid in. On top of that, if you are making a nice looking water cooling loop, not only for cooling efficiency, but also for the aesthetic part of it, radiators tend to look pretty cool, and there are some pretty nice models out there, like, uh, for example, these have a little helix in them. Um, there's plenty of you know examples out there of radiators i would try to i will go on this uh, again in a bit but um, some of these i'm seeing here are from a bit doubtful uh, manufacturing uh, and uh, uh, companies and i will go into that at the end but i would stick to the known and respected companies for this kind of stuff because it can be risky if it goes wrong and you don't want to go in there with shady products to be honest uh, now, for the pumps, the pump will basically make the um, uh, coolant flow through your system. Obviously, that's what the pump does. There are some combos of pump plus reservoir that acts as both. It's basically a pump and then a reservoir on top. Uh, something to be said about pumps and reservoirs. You want your reservoir to, in the, in the flow uh, that the water does, you want the, your reservoir to be directly before your pump so that your pump will have a steady income of water or fluid, whatever. Uh, and you also want it to sit a bit higher up than your pump is, so that 
gravity itself will feed the pump easier. That's just a side note. Um, in any case, pumps come in a multitude of speeds and rotations per minute and all that stuff. Uh, the rotations per minute do not matter a lot because uh, whether the fluid goes faster or slower, it's it's a common myth in water cooling that faster rotations will cool it, it will make it cool more efficiently. Uh, it's not really much the case. The difference is that um, if there is a lot of resistance from adding a lot more components, making it uh, pump faster will overcome that resistance a bit. On the other hand, if it pumps faster, it will produce a lot more noise. And um, while water cooling setups are usually a bit more silent, pumps tend to be the noisier component of it. Now, that said, same story. I go with a reputable manufacturer. Some pumps are variable speed settings, so um, I would honestly go with one of those, and uh, that way you have a lot of control whether how fast it goes or how slow it goes and the noise it produces. Lastly, well not lastly, but approaching the end, fittings. Fittings are basically uh, the joints of your water cooling loop. It lets you change directions, and they are especially important if you're doing uh, with hard tubing, because with soft tubing, obviously you can just uh, you know wiggle it around and make it do a nice curve easily. With hard line tubing, however, you do need more fittings to actually make those bends and curves and uh, make the tubes go where you want them to go without having to bend them uh, too co in a too complicated way. Now, tubings are also uh, fittings. Uh, sorry, are um, also one of the most common points for leaks to occur. So the least amount of fittings you can get away with the better although they are kind of a necessary part of your loop uh, they come in uh, you know a variety of uh, shapes angles uh, there's a 90 degree angle you can uh, fit them to each other as well if you want different angles uh, there's rotary uh, fittings that can spin around a little bit without getting you know loose and unscrewed uh, this is a perfect example of many different types of fittings. There's T fittings as well, which are handy because, and this is a note for if you are ever building your loop, you need to have a drain tube that will, you know, so when you drain it, you can easily uh, make the water go, the fluid go out of that loop without spilling it all over your parts. So you need a couple of uh, those extra T loops so that you can actually get the fluid out easier without too much of a complicated draining process. So uh, keep that in mind and have an extra exit tube for the water to come out of. Now, lastly, the fluid that you're going to use. Now, there are some misconceptions about the water cooling fluids. Uh, there are some that are only meant for showroom use and should not be left on your system 24-7 because otherwise the dyes and the things that make it all nice and shiny and colorful will just um, end up sinking and they will just deposit in your, uh, in your loop and you'll get a lot of gunk and residue in there and sometimes it can be hell to clean and uh, so make sure that the fluid that you're going to use is suited for 24-7 use for an extended period of time. Some colors in particular, like red, apparently they deposit a lot more and have a lot more problems with that. Not to say you can't use red color uh, cooling, but keep that in mind and make sure you have a good one that is of good quality. Uh, also, some people seem to have the misconception that if you use distilled water, which is water that has no ions in it and that is non-conductive, because water itself is not very conductive, that if you have a leak, it won't be a problem. Now, that is also a misconception, because while that is true, that distilled water is non-conductive, and it won't short out your board if you have distilled water on it in small amounts, uh, over time, as it comes into contact with the water blocks that are made of metal, it will pick up char electrical charge. Uh, little by little, bit by bit, but it will. So while that is true for the first few, uh, for the first period of time that the loop will be running, at the end of the day, it will still get conductive and it won't matter, uh, and it will still be a problem if it leaks. Something that there are a lot of uh, colors, uh, combinations. There's UV reactive fluid. You can take your pick. Uh, something that 
all of these fluids, whether you mix it yourself with a concentrate and some distilled water or if it comes pre-mixed, uh, what they all have in common and what you should always have in your fluids, and you should double check that, if, especially if you're mixing your own, is that they all have a um, uh, biocidal agent, uh, like a biokill agent for uh, algae, that sort of growth that can occur in water. And they also have anti-corrosives to minimize the corrosion of the metal parts of your system, like the fittings, water blocks, and radiator. So make sure that you do your research and get f cooling fluid that is actually suited for the system that you have, and that has all the necessary ingredients to make it effective, safe to use, and uh, to not destroy your parts over time. Now, those are ma the main components of uh, a, wa a normal water cooling loop. How many radiators you have or not depends on uh, how much cooling you want to get out of it. Uh, I am not going to be giving a whole overview of different brands or whatnot, but uh, there are some brands that are more uh, renowned in the field than others. And if you are going to research into that, and I advise you to research uh, deeply into each brand and how trusted they are and all that, I would advise not cheaping out on um, your parts because if every fitting, every different part that you put in there is a potential failure point. Now, if you are going with the cheaper stuff, that usually has not as much quality assurance as reputable manufacturers. So every failure point that you can eliminate is a bonus point in keeping your loop safe and uh, preventing potential leaks and problems in the future. One thing that I did not mention with the, when I was talking about the different components was the tubing. Now, I told you about uh, hard tubing, hard line tubing, and soft line. Now, the difference is as clear as the name uh, states. One is made of a rigid tubing that is not easily bendable. The other is of soft tubing that is nicely pliable and flexible and easier to work with. Now, what are the differences and benefits from those? I'll go over that uh, in a second. And uh, there is also other types of materials that people use, which I will also list. Now, starting with hardline tubing, uh, as you can see by these examples, hardline tubing is basically rigid materials. Now, what type of rigid materials? Some people use copper for a nice uh, steampunk look on their PCs. It's also a bit more expensive. There are people that use glass, which is a bit more difficult to work with and to b uh, make the, the cuts and uh, bends in place. Uh, it involves a lot more fittings because obviously glass is not really uh, bendable. So uh, there is that. It does look nice, but not handy to work with. Uh, there is acrylic. Uh, there is, you know, you name it, there are several materials, but those are the predominant ones that people use. Uh, benefits of it, uh, it is more sturdy, uh, it looks a lot better, but it is more difficult to work with and it is more difficult to maintain. Because if you need to drain the loop and replace a part or put a new part in, um, usually the you can't really make it nudge a few centimeters more or less to take something out or put something in. And if, let's say, you replace a CPU when the new water block is a bit different, uh, if it's not exactly the same size, if the hole is in the same position, you're going to need to get a new tube or make a new tube. Uh, it's also more difficult to bend. Uh, you need heat tools to bend it, uh, pipe benders or pipe straighteners, you name it. And uh, yeah. It's more difficult to work with in general, although it does look better. Soft light tubing, uh, on the other hand, as you can see, for example, in these pictures, I'll just pick a random one to show you. Uh, it is a lot easier. You can just uh, bend it, shove it, whatever. And if you need to replace a part, you just take it out and the tube comes with it and it's flexible and it's not really a problem. Sometimes you don't even need to drain the loop because uh, the water block comes attached and you just, you know, plop it out and hold it and uh, that should be fine as long as, you know, it doesn't leak through the fittings or something. What do people use for soft tubing? There's also a lot of uh, different things. It's mostly also um, pliable, plasticky like materials. Although if you do go with soft tubing, I advise you to um, check what the tubing and what the plastic is made of because it can react with some of the coolant fluid that you have and make it all cloudy and not so nice to look at. That's also a disadvantage because, uh, for example, glass tubing, it does not really stain. 
soft tubing like this, it can stain after a couple of years and uh, be a bit cloudy and not so nice to look at. So, But it's also a lot cheaper and a lot easier to replace and uh, put just new tubing in there if that does happen. Now, on the topic of soft and hard tubing, uh, the fittings are different. So you need to make sure that you have the right fittings uh, and the right compression thingies and all that stuff for the type of tubing that you will use. You also need to make sure that the diameter of the tubing and the fittings and the blocks, it all matches because there are different sizes of tubings as well and it all has to match. So you have to kind of really make sure that you have everything on the right size and uh, all of that to make it uh, all compatible. As for the fans, you want to go with static pressure fans as opposed to airflow fans. Normally it will be in the description or name of the fans that you are looking at. Uh, you can perhaps even filter it if you are looking in the comparison website. Uh, otherwise, they are usually recognizable. This is a nice diagram here. They are usually recognizable for having uh, bigger uh, fan blades and perhaps less of them. Why is this? It's because Normal airflow fans just have to push the air through without much resistance. Static pressure fans are op optimized to push the air through when there is resistance. And there is the resistance when you are using wa water cooling of the radiator fans that it has to go through. So it is important to have static pressure optimized fans to actually provide the radiator with enough airflow to actually uh, disperse the heat that is going through the fans. How can you compare different uh, static pressure fans then? Normally on um, normal airflow fans, you have to look at CFM. On uh, static pressure fans, normal obviously CFM is still important, but you also have to look at the pressure that uh, it can achieve. As usual, higher is better. Uh, these are the fans that I use on my AIO radiator. There are better ones out there. There's worse ones out there as well. Uh, I'm happy enough, but uh, I'm not here to advertise any brand or products. Uh, I went to the for them mostly for the looks and also for their relative efficiency. This was just an example for you guys uh, and feel free to pick whatever you prefer because uh, it's all a personal choice and it's all a matter of taste anyway. Now this video may have been a bit more uh, drawn out and a bit longer than I expected, but uh, I think I have covered most of the basics, along with some not so basics that people don't really necessarily need to know, like the size of the tubings and all that stuff. But uh, I mean, at least the information is out there and uh, hopefully the video was not too long because of that, because I honestly didn't keep track. In any case, uh, this is the basic information that you need to know when you're going to start building a water cooling loop. Uh, it's a lot to take in, so I advise you to do further research in just this video and for more specifics on the manufacturer's compatibility, uh, what is best with what, and all that sort of thing. Uh, I will perhaps do more in-depth videos in the future when I get around to water cool my desk as well, but that's not going to be in the near, near future, uh, so uh, don't hold your breath for that for just now. Uh, like I said, I hope you have enjoyed this uh, series of videos about cooling and water cooling. Uh, I know they're very superficial, but it should be enough to give you an idea of what it's all about. And uh, I might have scared people a bit with all the disadvantages and risks that I did. But like I said, if you do your research properly and if you take your time to make things work properly, you should be fine. And uh, there is always a risk when installing any new component and doing any new thing. There is always a risk. But virtually, take your time, make sure things are compatible, do your research, and it is perfectly safe and it is a lot more effective than everything. This has been Attic PC Guy. Uh, have fun and uh, see you next time.